Welcome to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry, a clinician's guide to the latest psychiatric research. I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. Each episode, I interview a leading psychiatric researcher about how their work translates into clinical practice. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Michael Bubu. Dr. Bubu is an assistant professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Population Health at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. His research focuses on the connection between sleep and neurodegenerative diseases. He also studies health disparities and the social determinants of health as they relate to cognitive health. In our conversation, we explore the importance of sleep, especially for people at higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Bubu. My pleasure. So we're just going to get right into it. Can you give us an overview of your work, particularly on the connection between sleep and neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, so my research, you know, the big picture just basically looks at the relationship between sleep and neurodegenerative diseases. Right now, uh, our focus is on Alzheimer's disease. However, you know, it is benchmarked to a reasonable extent on three pillars. And the first is really to examine sleep, wake cycles and activity or rest activity rhythms as well as looking at various sleep microarchitectural indices or macroarchitectural indices as well and see how they relate to or are associated with increased AD or Alzheimer's disease risk. And by Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at the clinical definition of Alzheimer's disease as well as the pathogenesis or the pathological processes involved in Alzheimer's disease. And the second prong really ties on the fact that sleep and various sleep processes are very much interconnected to various systems, more importantly, the cardiovascular system. So we're also looking at sleep as well as co-occurring comorbidities, including vascular risk factors, including neuropsychiatric abnormalities like depression, uh, that's intricately linked as well to sleep, looking at uh, things like other chronic comorbidities that can actually uh, reflect uh, in it themselves in sleep problems or sleep, you know, possibly is associated with them. Usually they are co-occurring comorbidities and how they together with a, either an additive or a synergistic effect combine to increase AD pathology and risk. And the third prong really here, we're, look, we're also trying to look at, you know, how we can use setting sleep metrics to help in terms of characterizing and identifying people at greater risk of mm. pathology. So it's basically using sleep uh, metrics or indices as a biomarker, a complementary biomarker, or a standalone biomarker that can predict AD risk, especially with the associations with the pathogenesis or the pathological processes that is involved in Alzheimer's disease. And, um, you know, I'd say, you know, just the first pillar will be looking at this in the context as well of health disparities. Mm. And looking at sleep problems in the context of health disparities? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're doing this because um, if you look at the data, right, uh, what it does suggest is what would term like sleep health disparities uh, that reflect themselves, you know, in various differences across racial ethnic groups in mm -hmm. sleep macroarchitectural variables. And by that, I mean, if we look at sleep duration measures, we're seeing that minoritized populations, including Blacks slash African Americans or Hispanics, they spend less time in terms of sleep duration compared to non-Hispanic whites. If we're looking at slow wave sleep, which is the, um, you know, stage three sleep, um, which is the deepest stage of sleep. We're also seeing in terms of duration, data showing that Blacks or African Americans spend less time, you know, in slow wave sleep. We're looking at amplitude as well. Even cutting across the circadian uh, reading uh, abnormalities or rest activity rhythms, we're also seeing data that suggests variation in that regard. And so, and all of these metrics were to reduce slow of sleep or slow of amplitude or activity or we're looking at reduced sleep duration they've all been shown to a reasonable extent to be associated with increased alzheimer's disease risk also if we look at 
sleep disorders, the very uh, prominent example is obstructive sleep apnea. We also see differences in terms of blacks or African-Americans or Hispanics or minoritized population really having a higher burden, carrying a higher burden in terms of OSC severity or symptom severity, presenting with excessive daytime sleepiness. And these, again, these various, whether it's OSC itself or the various, um, whether they're sleepy, excessive daytime sleepiness, you see evidence showing associations with Alzheimer's disease pathology. And because we understand that you know these differences are intricately linked to what we'll call social determinants of health, mm -hmm. right? We're investigating this using a health disparities research framework in which race, right, is being treated as a social construct, mm -hmm. okay? And so understanding that these differences that we're seeing in race is not because of some kind of inherent problem in a particular racial group, but because there are historical contexts that, you know, has resulted to a preponderance in terms of the affectation of social determinants of health, right, affecting a certain group relative to the other group. Basically, we're seeing, we're investigating what we'll call racism, right, mm. which ties to whether it is upstream factors in terms of policies and all of that, or midstream factors, or even, you know, that would ultimately have reflected themselves, expressing themselves in this phenotype that we begin to see in terms of the differences across uh, various health indices, or whether it's Alzheimer's disease, or whether it's sleep health disparities. Yeah, and, the, and these prongs, I mean, they seem very, you know, there's a lot of synergy between them. And at the same time, it's kind of looking at a different aspect of how sleep impacts people on the whole. And why is this such an exciting area of research for you? Yeah, so I'd say during my graduate school at Emory, this is where I began to investigate sleep and neurodegeneration, again, in particular Alzheimer's disease risk, I began to develop empirical evidence with respect to that. And in my doctoral level training as well, I was able to consolidate that with mentors and then looking at the biologic plausibility between sleep and Alzheimer's disease and looking at, you know, the disparities as well that exist between Alzheimer's disease burden and sleep health disparities burden knowing as well, you know, the relationship between sleep and AD based on the literature, when you look at that, you're noticing that in Alzheimer's disease, you have sleep problems. Mm -hmm. And these sleep problems would normally, you know, uh, accentuate themselves relative to the severity of the disease. We're also seeing, you know, new evidence showing that sleep can possibly precede the onset of AD. So if you look at the physiology and you look at the ascending arousal system, which is a system that regulates, you know, sleep-wake cycles, you're seeing that various anatomical elements in the ascending arousal system are affected in AD as well. You know, when you look at neurons in the brainstem, the locus cerulus, and other the tegmentopontine um, uh, nuclei, and all of these various nuclei are, are affected as well in AD. They regulate sleep-wake cycles and part of the ascending arousal system. We're seeing that 45% of Alzheimer's disease individuals have sleep problems. And then we're coming to see as well, like I said, the sleep problems can't possibly precede the onset. Well, we look at uh, slow-wave sleep, um, we're seeing evidence that shows association with, you know, glymphatic clearance, and this is clearance of um, the various abnormal proteins, right, that we see in Alzheimer's disease, like amyloid plaque or tangles. And we're seeing sleep, you know, related to the glymphatic system, helping, in fact, in terms of regulation of the glymphatic system. So all of this evidence, right, you know, drew my interest to looking at sleep and AD risk. Mm -hmm. And for as a personal motivation, it was my grandmother actually, when I was eight years old, 
and saw her very vibrant and active. And then in her later life, now she lived up to 99 years old, but in her later life, you know, she became very distant, you know, for, uh, had what I now know, right, to, uh, to be dementia symptomatology, uh, most likely of AD type. And, uh, you know, deteriorated badly uh, before she passed. And, you know, at that young age, I had that interest to, you know, become a physician and understand what would have occurred and transpired to make her deteriorate that bad. And and so that's how my background, you know, my background mm -hmm. training includes medicine, you know, uh, fellowship, postdoctoral training in neurology, neuropsychiatry as well as population aid and public health. So I have, you know, I see, I look at this in a broad, multifaceted perspective, uh, employing various multidisciplinary uh, techniques and skills as well. So is your idea that, you know, sleep problems are a causal factor with Alzheimer's or that sleep problems are an indication that somebody's at risk for developing Alzheimer's? Yeah, so uh, I think both scenarios are, possible and there's evidence to that fact mm -hmm. you know so the, the first thing is when we look at an association between an exposure and outcome right exposure now being sleep and the outcome being alzheimer's disease we do see an association so cross-sectionally and in a cross-sectional manner you're you know assessing both exposure and outcome at the same time point just a snapshot but that doesn't tell us which one comes first, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so we do have that cross-sectional associations that we see, whether it's sleep duration measures, sometimes fragmentation measures and disorders like insomnia, circadian activity rhythms, as well as obstructive sleep apnea, you know, being associated with dementia risk. But then to be able to tease out, right, to tell whether one comes before the other, you want to see design a lo prospective or longitudinal study. And there are a few out there that have actually shown that sleep problems can possibly precede the onset of Alzheimer's disease. All right? So, uh, but the general consensus in the field are a reciprocal relationship mm. where there's a possibility that the sleep problems can possibly precede the onset of AD. And then there's also a very strong evidence that shows that in AD, because you're having neurodegenerative processes going on that affects all these various sleep-wake nuclei in the ascending arousal system, you do have a, a preponderance of sleep problems as well, even affecting, you know, circadian rhythms uh, as the disease progresses. So, the, you know, the answer to that will be Absolutely, in AD or in dementia, because of the anatomical elements in the brain that are affected in AD, including elements in the ascending arousal system that regularly sleep-wake cycle, there is sleep problems. So neurodegenerative processes can worsen sleep problems and can present that way as well. And usually the sleep problems would worsen as the disease worsens. Mm. There's also evidence, and that's where our work is, trying to look at, you know, sleep as a marker of AD pathology and looking at various sleep processes. There's evidence showing, and some of our evidence has shown, especially if you look at obstructive sleep apnea, that it can precede, you know, in terms of prospective studies. You know, we do need more of that, though, uh, but we're seeing that it, it definitely can precede the onset of Alzheimer's disease. We're seeing evidence that it is related to the pathology. So we've shown ev we have evidence that obstructive sleep apnea, for example, is related to longitudinal or prospective changes in amyloid burden. And we're getting new evidence with respect to tau pathology as well. Was also seeing, you know, an interactive or synergistic effect between OSA and AD pathology like amyloid beta, you know, and how that impacts, you know, progression or time to progress into Alzheimer's disease. So sleep can possibly precede the onset of AD and AD patients definitely 
will have sleep problems because of the neurodegenerative processes that's going on. So that's, for now, that's the evidence that is there that sleep can actually be a risk factor of Alzheimer's disease. And it looks like in some of the public health research, they found that maybe up to 15% of AD could be prevented with interventions that help reduce sleep problems and disorders. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty powerful, right? Correct. So this is a meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis would normally, you know, look at evidence from various kinds of studies. Uh, This is a meta-analysis that, you know, I led, you know, looking at sleep problems that included sleep macroarchitecture variable in terms of duration of fragmentation measures uh, that also included disorders, insomnia, circadian activity rhythms, abnormalities, or say, Altogether, so it's a really broad definition of sleep problems that included all of those uh, stuff that I just talked about. And then looking at AD risk. And so, you know, we were able to conduct a meta analysis that actually provided, you know, a measure of association or a measure of estimate, an estimate, you know, estimated the magnitude of the effect of how sleep problems can impact AD risk. Okay, and so the conclusion there was we did see that sleep increases Alzheimer's disease risk. And then the other thing was to look at what you call the population attributable risk, in which you're trying to see the contributory effect of this particular exposure, which is sleep problems themselves, and how they impact Alzheimer's disease risk. And what we did see was that 15% of sleep problem, of Alzheimer's disease rather, you know, can be attributable to sleep problems. And again, sleep problems, broad definition, including duration, fragmentation indices, hypoxia indices, or disorders. And what that tells us in an epidemiological fashion, clinically really, is that if we can eliminate sleep problems, we may be able to reduce 15%, right? Mm of AD risk burden in the population. So that's that's that and these this is very significant because it, it, it is very similar to the kind of population attributable risk for very well established and known risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, like the vascular risk factors like hypertension, as well as, you know, lack of physical activity and all of that. So so we do see that the population attributable risk is is impactful. Yes. So fifteen percent of A D can be prevented if we're able to deal with sleep problems. That's what the data shows. Yeah, and that's um, you know, that's something that clinicians can take and utilize, whether it's with medication or treatment modalities, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The good news is that sleep problems can, you know, they're effective treatment modalities for sleep problems, all right? Whether disorders, in particular, the clinical application as it is, the, the evidence is, is, is very early, though, you know, because we need trials mm-hmm. to begin to show that we can affect or impact sleep and then we can see differences in terms of AD risk or reduction in the risk or we can see the AD pathology being affected uh, in terms of getting better. So that's that. those are studies that are, are, are ongoing. But I think with respect to disorders, first of all, I think it would be important for clinicians, right, to... When, when you're treating someone with obstructive sleep apnea, right? Especially an individual that has a sleepiness phenotype. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obstructive sleep apnea with excessive daytime sleepiness or other endotypes. It will be important to have in, in, in that clinician's mind, you know, to be able to counsel them about the possibility of cognitive decline or cognitive associations mm-hmm. with uh, OSA and the importance of, you know, ensuring that they adhere to treatment modalities that are being prescribed for them. For in, Same with insomnia, you know, or comorbid insomnia with OSA, that phenotype as well. Uh, it's important, you know, as well to look at individuals, like what the data is showing with OSA and vascular risk factors co-occurring and having a synergistic effect on 
progression to AD for individuals uh, in terms of time to progression or affecting, you know, changes in the pathology in terms of the markers. So it would be important, you know, to uh, aggressively, right, screen for OSA as well as co-occurring hypertension in various at-risk patient population and, and intervene early to, to, you know, prevent cognitive issues. There's strong evidence, you know, linking some of these conditions with cognitive outcomes, whether it's performance in terms of executive function problems, processing speed problems, attentional issues. So these are th ways that um, I think clinicians need to be alerted and, and be hypervigilant in terms of mm -hmm. uh, their interactions with patients. And it might adjust kind of the, um, the focus for treatment if sleep problems are a factor they shouldn't maybe be secondary. It should be primary in some ways. Yeah, I mean, it, not necessarily like primary, right? But it should be considered as a mm -hmm. whole, right? Yeah. So we're looking at, we're trying to treat the whole person and it should be considered as an important or vital factor that can play a significant role in terms of cognitive outcomes and decline and potential, right, for AD risk or AD development in the future. Alzheimer's disease is a disease in which the pathogenesis is very protracted. The pathogenesis from the data out there tells us that, you know, you can have earlier signs as much as 15 to 20 years back before you basically begin to see onset of symptoms or clinical wow. symptomatology. So it just tells us that we need to catch it early, mm -hmm. right? And then the, and the, the, there's a multiplicity of risk factors uh, with respect to cognition or dementia, Alzheimer's disease, as we know. And sleep is, I think, is a very important aspect that should be considered together with those factors. Mm -hmm. Primarily, again, because effective treatments, you know, and prevention, even modalities, right, exist for, for sleep problems and uh, could be as easy as, you know, ensuring the environment where one sleeps is okay, having a regular routine, change of schedule, you know, timing in bed and timing spent in bed. There's so many things that are that may not necessarily right require medications if we're just talking of arranging your time to be able to spend the recommended hours of uh, uh, of sleep time right so that that's easy but then when you do have sleep disorders right um, ensuring that doctors are looking out for all of these and be able to treat them promptly and encourage patients to be adherent um, explaining to them the possibilities or the importance, right, of being treated and, and being on top of the issues so that, because there's a possibility you're mitigating um, adverse health outcomes that could occur way down the lane, especially in terms of cognitive problems and Alzheimer's disease in particular. And are you saying, and even if you can see some of these factors 15 to 20 years prior, that there's a way to maybe slow down the process? Yeah, so that's what, that's what the field is trying to do right now, because most of the trials for Alzheimer's disease focused on the disease itself when it has occurred. But then there was failures upon failures upon failures, all right? Now there are issues, you know, debate about the pathology, the pathogenesis, which one is more important? Is it amyloid? Is it tau that we target or what have you? Irrespective of that, we do know, right, based on the biological definition that was proposed, that the presence of amyloid plaques is indicative that someone has AD type pathology. Now, amyloid plaques would be there, and then over time you have tau deposition occurring, which corresponds more to symptom onset or you know the clinical symptomatology uh, presentations that we see in in neurodegenerative processes, Alzheimer's disease in particular. And so now, even the drugs that have been um, approved. You know, whether it's aduhelm or aducanumab or the recent one that's been approved, they are targeting early stages of the disease, right? Uh, you know, with evidence of pathology. So why? Because maybe, and that's, and they're seeing some effects there. So I think that prevention will be key 
right? And prevention is key really to many disease processes. And early detection is also key. So with respect to AD, right, since we're identifying some of these risk factors and we know in an early stage in cognitively normal people, this is, um, our research is mainly on cognitively normal people. So these are people that are clinically normal in terms of cognitive performance, right? We're seeing these associations between sleep problems and AD pathology itself. So we're saying if we can identify certain markers or in our case where we're looking at sleep and look at sleep as a marker of AD pathology, we can determine early in the process and catch this early and then, you know, intervene on sleep, right? And because we intervene on sleep, the 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 hypothesis would be there's some causal mechanisms with respect to either pathology. And then if we intervene on sleep, then we would slow down possibly the process, the neurodegenerative process that occurs over time. Yeah, that's really exciting. And when you're looking at biomarkers, are you looking at biomarkers of sleep problems or biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, so we're looking at both. Mm. So there are biomarkers that are being even looked at with respect to, you know, the circadian science field and sleep field that employs what we'll call metabolomics, transcriptomics. Uh, on that side, uh, there are research looking at, again, microarchitectural indices, local sleep processes Mm -mm. as they, you know, relate to various brain regions and their research on the AD side, right, which looking at different biomarkers as well and and, and early stage biomarkers, late mid-stage biomarkers and new biomarkers uh, are being investigated as well Uh, because the goal of the, the biomarker is to be able to catch that disease early because the biomarker is expected to tell you. It's a marker that tells you, okay, there's an ongoing disease process and then it changes as the disease process progresses. So it's biomarkers in both sides. And then you try to relate those markers together and see if, if there's an association or if there's any kind of potential causal relationship between them. Yeah, it sounds like you're covering all your bases, trying to understand how all of this works together. And, you know, this third prong that you're talking about, the social determinants uh, that affect sleep quality, can you get into that a little bit more? Like, what should clinicians know about this? I know that we've been talking a lot in the last few years about social determinants, especially, you know, with a variety of conditions and problems. With this specifically, you know, what should we know about this? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the role of social determinants of health as they relate to health outcomes. So they are what they are, social determinants of health. They determine health outcomes, right? And I think the very first thing is to appreciate the role that they play. The second thing will be to, so irrespective of race, right? A low educated, poor white person versus a low educated or, or, or a low educated black person or Hispanic person would have poor health outcomes compared to their counterparts, meaning rich educated white person or rich educated black person, right? Um, I think that's important to understand. The second thing is to also understand that there are different, again, because of the historical context in the United States and other countries like the United States that have a history of racism or or slavery and all that kind of stuff over time, right? That there are particular racial ethnic groups, right, that are much more affected by these social determinants of health. And these are the things that are responsible for the variations in the outcome. They are, you know, to a large extent responsible for many of the disparities that we see And so it is important as well when a patient is sitting in front of you, right, to look at that context, not just the biomedical context, which focuses on the individual and usually tied to behaviors. You know, if you're going to tell somebody to exercise, right, and lose weight and that kind of stuff, and the individual goes back to their community where there's no access to parks, no access to gyms, and there's a food desert, 
there's no way that individual will ever come out, you know, achieve the goal that you're trying to set for that person. So understanding that and, you know, might help to direct, you know, whether it's just social support or social services that could help at least make things a little bit better. There's, there's so much, there's not, not much the, you know, one-to-one physician can do about that, but it can help the person become a more empathetic doctor, you know, understanding some of the challenges that can affect health outcomes, whether it's Mm. stress and all of that kind of stuff. I think that's important. On the research side, what we're doing, right, is making this known because so that they can impact and affect policy changes. So when you understand that the fact that there are food deserts in certain communities. There's so much noise that can affect people's sleep. Uh, there's no green space, all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, you can influence policies and to understand that, okay, this is what's really affecting the indices that we have in the United States, where the U.S. spends the highest amount in healthcare, but they're like 19 to 20, right? When you compare them to other developed world. And I'm sure they want to do better. And so to do better, then you have to change, have, you know, reimagining of policies. And, and, and this is where health equity comes in, to provide resources that an individual would need, tailored to that individual that will be able to equip the individual to be successful. So I think that mindset brought into the clinic is important to see outcomes. Otherwise, we'll just be dishing out prescriptions and then people are coming back and there's no effect either because they can't afford it there's no health care access or they can't exercise or they, they the access to food is wrong you know or they live in an environment in our case sleep that affects their sleep right they're in stressful situations their work does not allow them you know shift work and all of that stuff so there are many things that can impact health as well. And these are usually the mediators. And by mediators, I mean they explain the differences that we see in these health outcomes. And do you hope for, it sounds like you hope for some policy changes with maybe some external factors, but um, do you also think there could be some policy changes with regard to like sleep hygiene education or things of that nature as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, there is, in the sleep field, there are many things that uh, sleep researchers are fighting for, right? Whether it, with, with children in terms of uh, related to early school start times, right? Mm-hmm, to maybe, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so that kids can sleep, uh, have the necessary recommended amount of sleep that they should have, right? Um, things like even, you know, the daylight saving time and how that impacts sleep health or, you know, and, and so there are policy changes that are, I think are necessary, but we on our side need to provide the evidence and guide the policymakers on what they need to do, right, to make these changes. However, it's important that the, there's, edu- there's an educational aspect that is important also for the masses, right? So we as researchers or scientists or physicians should be able to educate with our patients, the population we serve, you know, regarding sleep and sleep health, sleep hygiene, and how that impacts their health, whether it is cognitive health or cardiovascular health or any other aspect of their health, because this is very important for them to understand. So education is key as well. Providing resources is key as well. Ultimately, you know, the upstream factors can be driven by us providing data that can drive these policy changes. Yeah. And, and you know, it sounds like you're doing a lot of the broad strokes work and, and then the granular work on the research side. For those listening that are psychiatrists, clinicians working with patients today, what do you want them to take from your research that they can implement into their clinical practice today? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the role of sleep in health outcomes, especially neuropsychiatric illnesses. I think many psychiatrists, neurologists, and physicians, primary care physicians know that uh, if depression, you know, you have associations with sleep problems there, whether it's anxiety issues or, you know, whether it's psychotic problems, you know, there there is a very strong association between sleep problems and this neuropsychiatric symptomatology. 
So I think it's important to, uh, as, as, as they, as physicians or we relate with patients, uh, it's important to also understand the role of sleep in these um, neuropsychiatric symptomatology, whether it's their onset or as, you know, co-occurrence within the disease process itself uh, and be able to provide you know, educational measures or whether interventions as well that could help to treat that aspect of it. I think it's also important, like I indicated earlier, to consider the the effect of social determinants of health, whether it's the environment where the person is, how that can impact sleep as well, how that can impact stress, how that can impact ultimately the biology or phenotypic expression in terms of disease. And it's important to basically treat the whole person and not just focus on, you know, the individual and put in an in in individual behavior, but also looking beyond that and looking at factors that can as well affect health outcomes. And, and so being more empathetic, right, and being more understanding of the role of sleep in neuropsychiatric symptomatology or disease processes and making a very conscientious effort to educate patients on sleep to intervene when necessary as well, you know, understanding the role that sleep plays in all of these uh, processes. Yeah, and it sounds like understanding the importance the, of the role of sleep and then also making sure it's a priority in, in the clinical work that one is doing, whether it's at the evaluation level, um, making sure that's a priority in your evaluation to specifically ask about sleep, which I think historically hasn't been a priority maybe in a psychiatric evaluation, but making sure getting, you know, detailed information about sleep and then making it um, part of the puzzle with regard to, you know, the treatment interventions that you're utilizing. Absolutely. That, that, that's it. You hit the nail on the head. So absolutely. So again, taking sleep as a very important aspect of all of the evaluation is important. Getting a good sleep history is important. And being able to under, uh, tie that also to ma a management plan. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that'll um, inspire a lot of clinicians to, again, make sure that this is an important part of uh, their evaluation and the work that they're doing with patients. So thank you so much for connecting your research in a, in a practical way to the work that psychiatrists and clinicians are engaging with. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing and can't wait to hear more. Okay, great. I'm very happy for the opportunity to discuss this as well. Thanks so much again for that conversation, Dr. Bubu. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry on your podcast app. For the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Langone, I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. See you next time.